Once again, thank you so much for joining us this evening for our Mid Coast Audubon Talk, Birding in Costa Rica with Doug Hitchcock. We are so happy to have him here tonight. He's a favorite at the Camden Public Library. And to tell you a little bit about the Mid Coast Audubon program before we begin our talk, we have Gail Presley here and we have Kit Pfeiffer. So Gail and Kit, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Julia. I'm Kit Pfeiffer, a member of Mid Coast Audubon. And uh, very briefly, let me just uh, uh, entice you to join uh, Midcoast Audubon in the various programs that we do. We have these programs all winter long, once a month. We offer free birding trips. We hope to again soon. And we steward several local preserves, beautiful sites for birding. We provide scholarships to individuals for attending natural history programs, free birding stations to libraries and schools so uh, we can get the next generation of birders going. And um, there's a deadline of March 30th on our website if you want to apply for your library or your school to get into that program. All of this is membership dues funded. So if you're not yet a member of Maine Audubon, Midcoast Audubon, please do join us. And now here's Gail Presley, board member of Midcoast Audubon, to introduce our presenter. Hi, everyone. Good evening. This is um, such a pleasure to be able to introduce Doug Hitchcock. He's the uh, staff naturalist at Maine Audubon. And in my humble opinion, it's the coolest job in our state. He is also an eBird reviewer and works on the Maine Bird Atlas as a outreach coordinator. He also has uh, every other week a column in the main Sunday Telegram where he answers your birding questions. So he's a busy guy. Uh, a little bit about Doug's background. He didn't start out as a birder. Um, he was actually uh, got very interested as, in photography. And when he went out into his backyard thinking, well, what am I going to take pictures of? All of a sudden there were birds. And that was it. Uh, the photography led him to this amazing passion. So a few months before, um, oh, I forgot to say, I got to go on this trip to Costa Rica and it was just awesome. Um, and a few months before we left, uh, I went down and went on one of Doug's bird walks down in Portland. And um, on top of his regular duties, he told me that he was um, very intensely studying the birds from Costa Rica, trying to learn about how to identify them, uh, what their habitats were and um, what, you would, what birds you would see and what kind of habitats and learning something about their songs as well. So Doug is just a terrific guide. He's one of those people who, you know, you can always rely on. He's um, calm, he's got a great eye for spotting birds, of course, and he makes sure that everyone on the trip gets to see the birds that um, are being seen by someone. So uh, it's, I don't think out of the 350 species we saw that I missed maybe four or five. Uh, in 10 days. It was just incredible. Um, he's also uh, funny and gracious and you know you're thinking about us spending 12 and 14 hours a day with 10 people that he's kind of got a shepherd around over a 10-day period. So he uh, held his sense of humor to the very end. And he's also one of the quickest people of setting up a spotting scope and getting the bird in it that I have ever seen. So that again helped all of us see the birds that we were um, there to see. And the last fun trivia piece was that we had um, a company that we went with called Field Guides. And our trip leader is just this amazing guy who does uh, bird trips all over Central and Southern America, South America. And um, just, you can't imagine that he hasn't seen every bird in the world pretty much. And we went to the top of a mountain at 11,000 feet and Doug spotted a life bird for this other very accomplished bird guide. And um, it was just like made that guy's whole trip. So that made the rest of our trip too. So um, I'm sure Doug will tell you all about that wonderful sighting. And we're delighted to have you, Doug. So unmute yourself and take it away. All right, Gail, thank you so much. Um, uh, I, can, I can only quickly reflect on uh, some of the nice things you said about being, you know, uh, whatever it was, timely and, and calm, cool, collected because, uh, I, I was, um, I'm, I'm actually off this week. It's my wife's 30th birthday. So we are uh, working on a, a little kitchen renovation project. Um, 
had this on my calendar as a 6.30 start for a long time and just happened to uh, think I would look through my slides first. So I'm so glad that I sat down at the computer uh, ready to, to dive into this um, well ahead of schedule now. So feeling calm, cool, and collected, uh, I'm going to start uh, sharing my slides. It's, it's a, uh, interesting, uh, here we go. Um, you know, th this is just a, a very fun program for me. So many of the programs that I typically do for Maine Audubon, um, working in the education department, I, I do lots of, uh, talks on everything from, you know, identifying warblers to birding by ear, um, some of it can be a little more intense and, um, you know, this, this one being more of just a travelogue, I'll, I'll try to shed a little bit of light on um, also just some of the uh, other things uh, Costa Rica has to offer, I guess I'll, I'll put it that way. But, um, you know, there, this was a, a fun one because, um, you know, with 360 something species that we, we tallied throughout the trip, um, I couldn't just show, you know, photos of every one. So to actually have to go through the uh, literally thousands of photos <laughs> that I took and uh, narrow it down for this. Um, I hope it's not too much of me just rattling off bird names, um, but that's kind of what the, the whole trip felt like. So um, uh, let's dive in. As Gail mentioned, this was a, a trip. Um, Maine Audubon started doing these partnership tours with uh, field guides, essentially hiring them. Um, if folks don't know them, they, they have a nice long history of kind of leading really what I would regard as some of the best birding tours uh, around the world. And uh, starting in 2018, we did a trip to South Texas, uh, journeyed a little further to Oaxaca, Mexico, uh, Louisiana shortly after that, and then Costa Rica was kind of the furthest afield uh, we've gone and the longest longest trip we, we've run. Um, and really there, the level of expertise that they're able to provide is what I think makes this, uh, uh, you know, such a wonderful trip. They also really know how to keep participants um, happy, which usually involves uh, comfortable beds and full bellies. Um, it was a fun one to uh, kind of go through this. Um, I will definitely say no one ever loses weight on a field guides tour. That's, that's uh, definitely a consistent thing, but um, wonderful to, to have field guides to work with. I'm gonna make a little plug at the end for them. Um, uh, maybe I'll do it now in case folks uh, need to drop off at some point, but field guides and a lot of these companies that you know, really relied on travel and people moving around the globe are, are certainly struggling right now during the pandemic, um, well, over the, the last year, um, has really put them on hold. I'll, I'll, I think I've got a slide or I've at least got the website that I'll show at the end. They've got some really cool stuff that they're putting online as content um, based on kind of a, a subscription model. So you can, uh, sign up to get these videos that their guides are still making out in the field. And, and it's more than just birding, it's even some, some cool uh, cooking, um, some artwork, uh, it's fascinating stuff, but I'll make the, the quick plug to them that it's uh, really some phenomenal people that work at field guides. Uh, I'm sure they're feeling the pinch right now um, and anything we can do to you know, help support them. I think we'll go a long way. Uh, I hope everyone knows where Costa Rica is. I'll, I'll quickly make fun of my mom a little bit that uh, I know she very easily mistakes Puerto Rico and Costa Rica, um, which maybe on, you know, depending on your exposure to the world, uh, here it is for you. Uh, <laughs> nicely sitting um, in Central America, uh, between Nicaragua and, and Panama, you'll find uh, Costa Rica, um, just under uh, 2,500 miles as the, uh, as the Trogan flies, as you can see um, by the line here. Uh, I'll zoom in on this in a second, but just to show you kind of the, the 
full scale of, of Costa Rica and the area that we covered, each one of these little yellow pins, I'll zoom in on, might be a little hard to see contrasting against the road there, but and this is what Google Maps can generate for us. Each one of those yellow pins is a location that we, uh, basically where we were birding. Um, this is just kind of saved through all of the eBird checklists that we submitted as we were keeping track of the birds um, throughout the whole trip. So starting in uh, San Jose, we, we kind of worked our way northward. Um, the topography doesn't show quite as well on this map as, as I would have hoped, but um, you've essentially got this very high mountain ridge kind of running right through the middle of uh, Costa Rica on the um, Caribbean slope uh, is kind of where we started moving up the mountains, uh, doing this nice, almost uh, not quite figure eight, I guess, but looping around, coming back through San Jose uh, up into those uh, very high elevations. And then um, for the last couple of days of the tour, uh, going around the, excuse me, Pacific slope, um, where we found some really dry areas. Um, and I'll kind of break down all of these. And, and what's really fun about this tour is that it covers a large area in 10 days was a, a fairly long tour, especially compared to some of the other ones we do. But um, being able to cover that many uh, different types of habitat, uh, you know, we racked up <laughs> essentially a nice uh, big list. Um, we're able to find some of the real specialties of of each habitat, but um, uh, I would call it kind of the best, uh, the best way to see the most in the shortest time. Uh, that was, that was essentially what I told field guides we wanted. Uh, TheTrueSize.com. If folks don't know this site, I find it fascinating because uh, as we look at maps, it can really uh, distort our view. Um, so what uh, the truesize.com can do is you can select different areas and, and see an overlay. Um, so uh, Costa Rica is not that big, uh, especially if we can compare it to uh, the size of Maine here. Um, so just hopefully that, that kind of shows you, especially some of our drive times, we, we uh, of course, we want to spend as much time in the field actually birding as as possible. But uh, to getting getting around the country was um, really not that bad. Um, for the sake of time, I might skip uh, some things I wanted to talk about. But the, the, I think there's a lot of interesting like misconceptions of, about Costa Rica. Certainly, I had an image in my mind before going, and the more uh, kind of research I did uh, around the country, the more I realized I have no idea what's going on there. So as a, a quick thing, Costa Rica used to be known as a exporter of, or, or their primary, ex, excuse me, their primary exports were things like bananas, coffee, pineapple, sugar. Um, nowadays, it is uh, things like medical instruments, electronics, uh, pharmaceuticals, those are the primary things that they are exporting, which is um, kind of crazy to me. It's, it's often described as the Costa Rica being the new Silicon Valley. Um, so anyways, Intel, this is the Intel microprocessor uh, facility in Costa Rica um, that it alone makes up 5% of Costa Rica's GDP. Um, so anyways, not to dwell on non-bird things too much, but. Uh, Fascinating country. Um, we can talk more about that stuff towards the end, but I have, uh, I'm on slide eight of 227. So uh, I'm gonna speed it up a little bit. Anyways, uh, this is flying out of Portland on January 15th. Um, remember what this was like to be on an airplane? Uh, um, I'll try not to dwell on COVID too much, but uh, really fun to leave uh, Portland behind at that time. The The flight was actually pretty easy. Um, it was an hour and 20 minutes down to Baltimore, then Baltimore to San Jose. It was a almost five hour flight. Um, total travel that day for me was about eight hours and, and 20 minutes. Um, so to leave Portland, 7.22 a.m. local time, uh, looking like this, and to 
have that evening. Um, 5.55 was the timestamp, but they're an hour behind us. Um, uh, this was a wonderful change. Um, I cannot wait till we can travel again. <laughs> Hotel Bougainville. Um, of course, as birders, we were immediately birding um, that afternoon, just uh, doing a, a quick walk around uh, the property, little orientation. Um, I really tried not to put too many pictures of food in, especially since I mentioned we're, we're doing a little kitchen renovation right now. So uh, anyways, um, wonderful food. Uh, uh, this was one thing that you, you always hear about, but you can't quite appreciate, especially just the freshness of some of the fruit uh, that we found down there. Um, uh, even if you don't look at a single bird, you should go to Costa Rica just to eat the food. Uh, but maybe even more delicious than the food were some of the eye candy in the form of the birds that we saw. Um, this is just walking around the hotel, um, basically the, the morning of, of day one. Um, depending on where you've traveled, some of these birds uh, might be familiar to you. They might look very familiar. And this is one of the really most fun things about going to the tropics to me is when you start to see kind of the the massive radiation of, of, you know, similar looking species that's going on there, the evolution that's just uh, rapidly uh, undertaking. And you get remarkably similar looking species that maybe just sound a little different, occupy different areas. Um, so maybe if, if any birders here have ever seen like a kiskadi in South Texas or something, it looks very similar to this social flycatcher. Um, Anyways, you'll see some similarities. Maybe even in your backyard, you might know the Melanerpsis woodpeckers, the um, red-bellied woodpecker, which is marching its way kind of up the coast of Maine right now. Um, the common Melanerpsis down there was the Hoffman's woodpecker. Um, so very uh, same genus, different species, but very cool to see kind of the same uh, niches being occupied by who's evolved there. Some familiar faces. Um, and I'll quickly say, uh, photography in the tropics was a challenge. Um, there, the reason I took so many thousands of photos was because I deleted so many, I needed to delete so many thousands of photos. Um, some challenging lighting situations, but anyways, uh, I cherry picked for this. Um, folks might recognize this summer tanager. Um, so it was really fun to see summer tanagers barely make it to Maine, um, really kind of a, a, you know, breeding across the eastern U.S. Um, uh, we do not have them breeding in Maine, but they're uh, overshoot in the spring. So there were some familiar birds is the point I'm trying to make. Um, and I, I think it's always really fun to see some of our birds that have now flown a couple thousand miles to spend the winter and really <clears throat> important area. Uh, some spectacular things like mot mots. Uh, we were able to track down a few different species and this one, the lessons mot mot. Um, again, right on the grounds of the hotel. Like this is how you know you're in the tropics when there are just, you know, insane birds like this hanging out essentially outside of your room. Uh, this is a tire. Um, <laughs> Uh, shoot, uh, uh, white eared ground sparrow. Um, sorry, one of, I thought this was one of the coolest birds and a very interesting uh, thing about some of these, these species. You, you might look in the book, you might see that it's a fairly wide ranging species like across Costa Rica, you know, it puts that nice uh, purple splot on the map. But some of them have just become so localized that there's really only a few reliable locations to see these. So we knew that something like white-eared ground sparrow, we'd either have to be incredibly lucky on the rest of the tour, or we knew that they were seen on the grounds at the hotel. So it was one of those, um, especially with our other guide, Jesse, who um, you know has traveled extensively, uh, knows these birds well. Um, you can always kind of see that, that what I'll just call a, that sigh of relief um, when you get that target bird. So in this case, our, our white-eared ground sparrow um, 
was a nice target. Uh, this was, um, I think, right after breakfast, before we were, um, maybe just before. I've, I've, uh, anyways, doesn't matter. We saw 22 species, 11 which were, were new birds for me. So um, from my perspective, we were off to, uh, really off to the races with this. We had a, a nice large van that we could fit everyone in. Um, wonderful to have local drivers, especially as a guide. That tends to be one of the most stress-inducing things on in our domestic tours, um, Texas and Louisiana. Um, I would have to drive the vehicles, but let me tell you, none of these, none of our participants would have wanted me driving in Costa Rica. Um, but it's wonderful because it lets you kind of take in the scenery. Uh, one of our first stops was uh, this great spot, La Paz uh, Waterfall Gardens, as you can see on the sign here. And this will just give you a little taste of what um, Costa Rica birding can be like. Um, so Sue, one of our tour participants, just hanging out by the hummingbird feeders here and things like banana quits, uh, I can see what, three, four, five different species of hummingbird just showing off in front of us. And, and these things are just absolutely gorgeous. So uh, from the, the very large violet saber wing, still pretty good size, purple-throated mountain gem. Uh, it sounds like a funny name for, for this hummingbird, but it's a female. The males live up to the name just a little bit more. Um, Always a challenge to kind of get the, the correct iridescence to show on these birds, but uh, purple-throated mountain gem. The green thorn tail, just a kind of insane looking tail on a hummingbird. Even some of the less colorful ones um, were really just truly really stunning coppery-headed emerald. My favorite, uh, pretty much no color at all, the black-bellied hummingbird. And I couldn't find it, but I'm pretty sure this is one of the examples of, um, there's a number of tropical birds that are evolving black plumages that are light collecting. Uh, the way that the, um, basically the melanin is kind of shaped within the feather, uh, it, it essentially causes the light to bounce within the feather. So it, no light gets reflected back. And so there's a number of these uh, essentially black looking birds uh, and to my eye, like this, this was just so remarkably dark that I, I have a hunch, like you would almost never see any, uh, any shimmer or shine from it. But um, anyways, that was one of my favorites, the black bellied hummingbird. I mentioned that banana quit. If anyone's traveled to like the Caribbean um, or a number of countries uh, in the new world that um, a lot of them tend to have banana quits really just south of the United States, um, but they all kind of tend to look different wherever you go. There's a number of different subspecies. Um, so it's always fun to me to see like, to see a bird that you might know, but to see it in kind of a different appearance. And there's some interesting examples of that that I'll show in a bit. Um, man, it doesn't look like this outside my window right now. Um, this <laughs> Uh, absolutely just, just beautiful kind of tropical environment. Uh, remember, we're kind of in the um, Caribbean slope right now, uh, which tends to be very wet, especially as, as we'll see in a little bit once we get to the Pacific slope, very dry, much more arid. Um, but notice blue skies, what a wonderful thing on our first day. Who would have thought we would appreciate blue skies so much? Um, Walking around, getting to see some familiar birds. Sorry, this is a, a little small, but uh, Louisiana water thrush, another species that's um, gonna be returning to Maine uh, probably late April. They'll be uh, showing up on fast flowing streams, especially in Southern Maine. Um, but one of our, our little neotropic warblers that'll be migrating back here. So fun to see them. Uh, and Pinanax flycatchers, you know, they're hard enough for us to identify when we see them in Maine and they're even, you know, singing. And Pinanax flycatchers being things like alder, willow uh, flycatchers, which actually look identical. 
Um, this is where I was, I was so glad to have uh, Jesse Fagan who could just, you know, uh, at a quick glimpse, just say, yep, yellowish flycatcher. It also helps that they just have names like that down there. Um, yeah, because it was kind of more yellowish. Um, Rufus Collard Sparrow uh, almost became like one of the, I hate this term, I apologize, but a, a trash bird, it becomes so common that you just, you know, get out of the way, Rufus Collard Sparrow. Like we're trying to see other, other things. So um, like house sparrows here, you would often just see Rufus Collard Sparrows, you know, uh, edges of parking lots and, and constantly singing, um, really throwing you off, but, but truly stunning birds. And that is kind of one of the fun things about traveling and getting to see, you know, beyond things like a, a bard Bacard, uh, which is just fun to say, um, you know, a lot of these were, were brand new for, for most of us. A big target, much like I mentioned, the, um, <sighs> the white-eared ground sparrow from the hotel, we knew that we really wanted to be looking for the sooty-faced finch when we were at La Paz. Um, here's my example of, uh, you know, looking at this range map, you would think that this bird was, you know, kind of all over the place on the Caribbean slope of um, Costa Rica and into Panama. Um, but they've really just become difficult to find, uh, at least have a, a reliable spot um, and we found this little group of a uh, couple birds, um, uh, luckily for, for us, right after lunch. And these are just, you know, wonderful places. Really, uh, ecotourism is such a, a large driver of a lot of the um, activities and things that, that go on in Costa Rica. Um, so uh, I really wanted to show some pictures like this because typical of birding, we also ended up just on, you know, back roads, side of the road, weird communication towers. Um, you know, it, it wasn't just going from like beautiful birding destination to, to the next one. As, as birders, we also had, you know, we didn't visit a water treatment facility or a dump. Um, so we did all right. <laughs> um, Huge credit to uh, Sandy DeShane here. Um, uh, injured her foot, I think broke her foot or ankle um, shortly before needing to depart for the trip. So the fact that she um, kept up and <laughs> of course she's missing from this photo. Uh, anyways, did a great job kind of uh, sticking with us. Um, just beautiful birds everywhere. Uh, and you really don't need to be at a, a crazy hotspot, as I mentioned. So this was called the um, uh, Galleria de Calibre. It was just a, a spot that we decided to stop at. Um, again, we had a, a specific target that we were gonna be looking for here. I loved, um, I was giving, uh, Jesse is the guide uh, that we can see in the photo here. And I just really appreciated that, you know, we parked right in the spot for Costa Rica birding. We knew we were there. The fun thing about going to places like this, that this was essentially just a little cafe rest stop on the side of the road. Um, you know, imagine just going into maybe behind a Cumberland farm or something and, and all of a sudden there's a bird feeder like this. These are mostly clay colored thrushes that we can see in the photo, but you know, to set up just kind of this makeshift little uh, set of perches, putting out a few bananas, a couple hummingbird feeders, and we spent so much time here, um, just kind of really enjoying some of the, the great views and, and feeding stations are just a fantastic aspect of it. Because things like Northern Emerald Toucanet, um, instead of seeing them just as a little speck way up in a tree, they'll come right down and essentially feed right in front of you or very skulky little um, common chlorus fingus, uh, same thing. Uh, it, it's almost more of a challenge to just try and get photos of them not sitting on a banana. Um, it, it looks better, but yeah, you just, you, you sit, you wait, and it's just uh, kind of the, the rotating door of, of amazing birds coming through. Um, or, uh, excuse me, crimson collared tanager, silver throated tanager, uh, 
you know, the, the more, the, the fun part of this as a guide, especially is when you're trying to get a mouthful of a bird's name out to get everyone on it. Um, anyways, not all tanagers are, are quite as beautiful uh, or I should say as, as brightly colored. Um, I think that palm tanager has the um, awesome subtle beauties in it. Uh, especially when you start looking at like the, the little gradients of olive colors in the wing, but palm tanager, blue gray tanager, uh, red headed barbet. Again, this is basically me just standing in one spot, looking at that one little row of uh, four bananas that were sitting out um, and photographing the birds as they were coming into it. Again, fun to see some of, uh, our, in quotes, our birds, birds that are gonna be in Maine throughout the summer, Tennessee warbler here. Not quite how they look when they're uh, in Maine in the summer. Uh, of course, they're in their non-breeding or basic plumage throughout the winter. And then uh, probably one of the most abundant birds we saw, um, much to the, <laughs> uh, always seemed to offer a, a very fun, um, identification challenge for us, um, you know, at different angles and things. This one's got just a little hint of, of its namesake, but this is a chestnut-sided warbler. Again, a nice uh, common warbler that'll be breeding across Maine come summertime. Um, but certainly important to note that, you know, they're only in Maine from maybe May, June, July, uh, starting to head south in August and really gone by September. Um, so for those other, uh, whatever it is, eight months or so, they're spending their time in, in Costa Rica. So that little window that we get them, it, it um, hopefully shows you how important an, an area like Costa Rica is, not only for the, the huge diversity of birds that they have there, but for the, the species that we think of as our breeders. Um, they're arguably more dependent on uh, the good habitat in some place like Costa Rica than, than here. Um, as I mentioned, the, the birds will essentially show off right in front of you. So here's Sandy with that uh, toucanet just feeding on some fruit um, uh, too close for her to use her binoculars. And, and then, you know, the funny thing looking at a photo like this is, you know, not only are we at this wonderful cafe with stunning birds uh, right there, but like, Look at the waterfall in the background. Um, you, you really can't beat it. Um, take me back. I try to challenge myself to see how many birds could I photograph uh, with a cup of coffee. Um, I, I didn't put them all in here, but it was Jesse helping point out the toucanet for me while I enjoyed. I, I cannot say enough good things about the um, the local shade grown coffee down there um, really just had a, a flavor well beyond anything um, we find up here. Um, here was our target. Uh, you might think, you know, some of the um, doves, uh, <laughs> the columbiforms, the, the morning things like morning doves, rock pigeons, maybe not too high on people's list, but to see a buff fronted quail dove is actually like a very hard thing. On a lot of tours, this might be a bird that is maybe just heard at a distance or something. Um, and the reason we made the detour to come specifically to this spot beyond the coffee and the views was to try and glimpse these uh, buff fronted quail doves that were there. And there were actually two around. So you might notice this one has this, um, uh, more adult plumage, the very slate gray breast. Um, and then there was this younger one you can see with that kind of modeled um, kind of scaling on the chest. So to have them essentially just walking around uh, right underneath the platform that we were all uh, sitting and enjoying the view from um, was really uh, lucky in terms of our timing, but um, that's really what birding is. Uh, I got a kick out of the, the name, the hotel we stayed at was La Quinta. A um, little different from the, the chain you might find in Portland, um, but <laughs> appropriate for where we are. Um, uh, uh, it, it, a little joking aside, it, it did have a, a, a more localized name um, 
at this lodge, but showing how we're kind of getting more into the lowlands on the Caribbean side. Um, so we're going to see a little change in habitat. Um, uh, of course, birding 24 seven, you can see the sun's going down a little bit. I did have to borrow this photo from uh, Woody Gillies. Uh, uh, just love these uh, collared arsaris um, putting on a show right at the hotel. And that is the end of day one. Um, so I'm not gonna go day by day for this because um, obviously we're gonna run out of time pretty quickly. Um, but end of day one, we racked up 89 species visiting just a few locations. Um, and especially the, the goal was to kind of get us out of um, uh, the capital, uh, San Jose. So La Selva was kind of our big first destination. Um, the, it's a biological reserve I'll talk about in a second, but um, this is when we started to realize that, you know, we were taking the blue skies for granted because the Caribbean slope, um, this is what you tend to get. Uh, as soon as we got out of the van, uh, you can see on the left photo here, um, we were essentially had turned around, we're heading back with our rain gear on. Um, we tried waiting it out. This was this photo on the right, I just took literally out the door as we were essentially sitting there watching it rain. It did let up enough um, or we were too excited to go birding that we did decide to just um, essentially chance it. Uh, we took uh, several trips to um, La Selva. So um, uh, maybe if Gail or, or if anyone else is wondering about the, the timeline here, um, kind of just blend this together for the, the sake of, um, of storytelling. But the amazing thing about La Selva is just, it's, it's this biological reserve it's something like 1,500 uh, hectares um, of mostly lowland tropical rainforest. Um, being that size, uh, an interesting thing to me about it is that only about 55% of it um, was what they called multi-layered communities of uh, primary forest. And that's, you know, that's what's so great. That's where, that's the high quality habitat that's gonna be hosting so many birds um, and, and other wildlife. Um, but uh, that other 45% of it um, was basically abandoned pastures and plantations that they had um, purchased as part of it and were essentially slowly going through various stages of succession and using it as kind of, um, as part of this biological station, it was basically an experiment uh, constantly working. So, so seeing what they could plant, how they could kind of, um, again, go through those stages of, of succession to get back to uh, the forest that was needed. So um, to rattle off some numbers, uh, La Selva hosts, uh, they say 300 scientists and 100 university courses every year. We got to see just uh, at least a, a couple of classes that were going through um, uh, remarkably, La Selva um, has had, I think it's over 500,000 species of plants and animals identified in it. A, a lot of those are insects. Um, in the tropics, you really start skewing numbers when you start counting um, just moths alone, I bet are, are probably tens of thousands, but uh, over 5,000 vascular plants, just um, 300 species of trees have been found there. And they're just shy of 500 species of birds. So just in this one location, you could probably spend like a whole 10 days there and still just, just barely scratch the surface. So for us going around, um, wonderful to be able to find things like uh, garter trogon. Uh, nice thing about going there is that we would, um, to bird around the biological station, you'd have to have uh, local guide with you um, that was essentially assigned to you um, uh, through the station. So, um, and these guys just have kind of amazing eyes and ears, uh, say nothing of how good um, Jesse was, uh, but especially um, their ability to just pick up little movements. And what's really remarkable to me is like how little they use binoculars 
um, they'll carry their scope uh, just to make sure that we can all get views of things like the semi plumulus kite. Um, and you can't beat local knowledge when they know like a, an owl's favorite roosting spot. Um, so this was some pretty uh, unpleasant rain that we were coming back in. Uh, you can see we're all trying to keep the scope dry as he was uh, actually using the, the sight on the scope to try and line up on this uh, middle American screech owl that was just roosting in the day. And they kind of know that this owl likes the same area all the time. So. Um, Anyways, this is what it was like birding La Selva. Um, sorry for some shaky video, um, but sometimes you needed a little extra rain gear. It was nice being at a biological station because you could just, you know, walk around the grounds, um, find bits of shelter. Here's uh, another guy that we were with, I guess, our second time going. Um, uh, and, you know, there's just so many birds that they really have to stay active. Um, me with my coffee. Guess what? It rained. This was back at um, our the hotel we were staying at was fairly close by, so we would often go back there um, just for meals and things, uh, try and dry out a bit, uh, and even just hanging out right at the feeders on the grounds of the hotel during you know this was just after lunch one day, photographing things like red-legged honey creeper, green honey creeper, which um, no, I didn't. I didn't even adjust the saturation in this photo. They're just that absurd. You don't often think of um, things like rails hanging out at bird feeders, but this rufous naped wood rail would uh, come and feed underneath the feeder, often going after some of the fruit and things that were put out. Buff-throated saltator, variable seed eater, one of my favorites, the rufous mot mot. I mentioned the mop up before. This is our second species. Um, oh, I might have this out of order, but uh, we were heading back to La, um, La Selva. Um, nice amount of, of uh, mammals that we did see on the trip. Not a, not a huge number, but um, between the, uh, especially monkeys, we saw uh, spider, howler, white-faced capuchin, um, but on kind of between La Selva trips, we, as I mentioned, you know, you can essentially just bird the side of the road as soon as you get in, into good habitat, uh, you find interesting things. Um, almost in the same way of like, uh, I always feel like when I'm doing Christmas bird counts and I start birding just random areas um, and you realize that, you know, birds don't just hang out at Audubon sanctuaries, uh, they're all over. So. Things like barred ant shrike, the male and the female showed off. Yellow terranulate, you can see this is just a barbed wire fence on the edge of the road with a brush pile behind it that uh, they started piling up in. Another, uh, I think another melanerpsis, this is the black cheap, excuse me, black cheeked woodpecker. Uh, and constantly, you know, flying around things like mealy parrots, um, one of our big targets at La Selva that we did see from very far away, but um, we were more fortunate kind of in the open country to get good flyby views of these great green macaws. Uh, very sensitive species, a number of macaws have kind of been, um, uh, their wild populations are really dwindling because of the, the pet trade, unfortunately. And they, they tend to nest in kind of larger, older trees and cavities. Um, and with deforestation, we also lose a lot of that nesting habitat. So uh, uh, if I say this right, Canaan Farm um, was just this, this spot that we saw that we thought we would try birding. Um, incredible, crazy looking birds like long-tailed tyrant. Um, you can see, I apologize for the quality of the photos. This is, you know, the gray sky behind is, is always challenging, but we got one of our biggest targets there. I think it was, um, uh, was it Kristen that, that spotted this? I just remember her saying, my, my binoculars were fogging up like crazy because it was so wet. Maybe my, my heavy breathing and, and excitement didn't help, but um, uh, there's not very many like pure white birds, but snowy Katinga 
is a pure white bird. And I just remember her like kind of shouting that out. Um, uh, you know, I'm looking at this white bird, it's pretty good size. And, and you know, you kind of know just, just by those few uh, descriptions exactly what it is. And, and this was a, a big target uh, for us. So pretty awesome to literally just like find them on, uh, um, maybe I shouldn't admit this with, with Gail here, but we were just kind of trying places. We didn't necessarily know where we were going. Um, anyways, monkeys, we were back at La Selva seeing things like Rufus Tail Jackamar. Um, why they put this shaky bridge in um, right at the entrance to La Selva. Uh, wonderful experience if you're not afraid of heights or bridges that, that shake at all, but it was fun. It got us to access different sides uh, of the park. Um, seeing our first mannequin, unfortunately a female. Nails are really quite stunning, but white collared mannequin. Uh, great, uh, great curacao. Uh, the females and then the males that have this uh, kind of ridiculous little yellow growth over the um, that sheath of the bill. Mistletoe tyranulate. Uh, just gonna rattle off some of these to show the diversity. Scarlet Rump Tanninger, Blackface Grosbeak. We tried for an evening walk, um, really hoping to get some owls. Um, they were not cooperative, uh, probably because of the weather, um, but we were able to find things like this uh, common parake. Um, which for folks, uh, uh, it's in the night jar family. It might remind you of something like a common night hawk or Eastern Whippoorwill, uh, very close relative. Um, and this was us just, you know, putting a little flashlight on it as we passed by. One of the coolest things, uh, unfortunately we didn't find many uh, owls on this walk, but just walking around using flashlights in trees, we actually spotted a few roosting birds, um, uh, including these wood thrushes. We found a couple of wood thrushes, which, uh, is another neotropic migrant that they're going to be, um, you know, migrating back to Maine in, in May. Uh, and I'm pretty sure these were the only wood thrushes we saw of the tour. So kind of interesting. They're, they're such a skulky bird. You know, we tend to see them in Maine. Like you hear them a lot more than you, you see them. Um, and, you know, we only saw them there, especially at night, because they have these bright white bellies that were really illuminated by our flashlights. So. Very cool to see these night roosting birds, um, something that we, we typically don't think about birds at night that much. Um, I'm 99% sure this was harlequin tree frog. Um, it's a little confusing because there's a species in the Philippines named harlequin tree frog, but it's not this one. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, fun to go around at night and kind of track down different noises and sounds, find things like caiman. Um, leaving La Selva, uh, and I got to pick up the pace here. Um, we stopped at this guy and, and I really wanted to kind of highlight him because I think he's one of the perfect examples of, uh, ecotourism at its best. Uh, this was Cope, um, and Cope basically turned his backyard into a, a birding hotspot to this, uh, destination place to go. He's a phenomenal photographer, very good guide. Um, and there you can find him on the map, Don de Cope. Um, I thought that we had missed our turn because as we were driving down the road to get there, you might see um, this uh, Isuzu restoration or um, uh, this used auto parts store right at the corner uh, at this intersection. And we, ba we were basically turning into the auto, auto parts store and driving down, you know, where all these houses are. Um, clearly, we missed our turn, but there was uh, Cope's house on the side. And the backyard that he's got, he's got this wonderful little water feature. Notice the rain. Of course, it rained. Um, I tried to mute most of the videos, sorry for that audio. Um, but by just putting out uh, feeders, some local, some uh, native plants, uh, he's really kind of turned it into this, this wonderful little hide in his backyard. 
and you can just sit and watch dozens of species of birds come through and it's pretty nice to just be able to study your field guide when the birds are perching less than a foot in front of you so um you can see the rain but uh things like chestnut headed oropendula montezuma oropendula these are close relatives in, in the blackbird family fairly close to things like orioles and if you ever see the long kind of hanging nests that they build uh it's a nice nod to that i really love red legged like honey creepers as as a person that likes taking pictures of birds um they just look made up if i was going to give my nephew a, a box of crayons um this is the bird that he would color um orange chin parakeet and the hummingbirds there were just phenomenal crowned wood nymph uh bronze-sailed plumeleteer great name white neck uh jacobin and then our big target, we, we kind of just knew that uh, his backyard was just going to be phenomenal uh, for birding. But uh, again, one of our uh, target birds to be looking for was the white tipped sickle bill, um, the species of hummingbird that has this just amazing, unique adaptation in, in the, the shape of that bill. Um, and it's adapted like that really because of the, the flowers that it specializes on. So uh, things like heliconias that that bill is just going to be perfect for um, reaching deep down in and getting to the, um, the nectar that it wants. Now I will admit that uh, Cope will harvest these flowers from around the area and then hang them there so that uh, it helps keep the bird in his backyard and, and able to keep tracking down and, and show tons of people. We did go for a short walk with him um, and his ability to just kind of read the landscape is amazing. So here he noticed that this leaf was kind of folded over. So inside of it must have been Hondurian bite bats. Um, nice photo he took for us there. Um, and then some of these interesting kind of burls and trees that uh, he knew bats would be roosting in. Um, as we keep going, we're, we're going to switch over, uh, get to some high elevation. This is uh, really, we're fairly low down before. Um, as Gail mentioned, it's about to get cold um, and the bird life is going to, to really change. And we're going to kind of switch over to the um, Pacific side in a second here. Um, so of course I had to get more birds with my coffee, um, but just some stunning hummingbirds of, you could go to Costa Rica and just look at hummingbirds and, and be satisfied. Um, things like lesser violet ear, tamalanka hummingbird, named after the mountain range up there. And then probably one of the showstoppers, um, you know, it just doesn't quite do it justice, but the fiery throated hummingbird um, just has the, the full rainbow on, across its chest. And then you look down every now and then and there's, um, uh, Oh shoot, I didn't label it. Which one is this? Large footed? Uh, uh, I should have just said something with confidence. Uh, that's the that's the trick to being the guide. Um, if, anyways, anyone knows, if anyone knows, they can go ahead and type it in the chat box and I'll say it out loud. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure it's large. It's a, it's a silly name. It's like large footed finch or large footed ground finch. Um, Martha says large footed finch. Oh, thank you. Jeez. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, uh, Gail mentioned this. Uh, notice how bundled up we were. This was where you don't think you need to bring that many layers to the tropics, um, but this was as, as cold as we were gonna get. This was close to 11,000 feet in elevation, um, really just targeting a, a couple species. This is the uh, Cerro Buena Vista Communications Towers was the only road to get us up this high. Um, one of our big targets there was the volcano junco, um, might look similar to our dark eyed junco. They're very closely related, but that yellow iris helps give them away. And there was actually one as soon as we pulled up, um, and, uh, there's another bird Jesse was looking for that he, he figured would be around. And with all the experience he has, I 
really, you know, let him take the reins and, and I would do, you know, I would set up the scope as fast as I could. I would help, you know, maybe play some bird songs to help call things in. And I just remember him being like, you know, I'm going to focus on these couple species. Doug, like, if you just want to try playing some calls of the, you know, pegbilled finch, maybe they're up here. Um, so I start playing and almost immediately we start getting a response. And sure enough, uh, coming right out to show off for us, this pig-billed finch, this is the one that Gail had mentioned was the life bird for Jesse. Um, and so I, I, uh, she gives me credit for finding it, but uh, Jesse had just a couple of minutes before said like, they're probably not here, just, you know, keep yourself occupied and play some, some recordings of it. And um, uh, we can talk about that maybe in a little bit, um, but I see it's a little after seven already. So I want to do this um, much faster, but uh, using playback to, to lure out birds is, is a common technique um, done sparingly, but uh, it's, it's really how you're going to see more birds in the tropics. So uh, I'll speed this up and just tell a couple stories. This is why I don't drive. This was terrifying. Um, as we're kind of going through the mountains, we get to uh, Sebae Gray Mountain Lodge. Um, we're told we're, you never want to tell participants who are absolutely exhausted that they need to be up, you know, well before sunrise, so that we can load in the van, so that we can be on site at 5:45 a.m. Basically, birding in the dark with hundreds of our <laughs> closest friends. Uh, this site is is very well known for. Um, uh, whew, uh, resplendent Quetzal, um, excuse me. Uh, and this is such a well-known spot that there are just tons of people, locals from, from lodges who are, have radios talking back and forth to each other so that when one is sighted, everyone can descend on it, uh, and get this stunning view of the Quetzal, um, Thank goodness we saw it. We got to go back, have breakfast, uh, load up into some Jeeps so that we could drive up um, to kind of a, a extra trail for us to just kind of spend the day birding. Notice how dry it is here. Um, higher elevation again, nice kind of broadleaf forest, but super dry on the ground. This is the nice thing about kind of moving over to that Pacific slope. Um, as we started our way down, wonderful, you know, diversity of birds, lots of new species. Um, and we found our own Quetzal. And then we found a female with it. And we kept walking, going along. We ended up finding seven Quetzals along uh, this stretch of trail. Um, so we couldn't rely on those. It was nice to have the, the group effort early in the morning. But um, I think knowing what we know now, uh, or if, if we could have known that we would encounter seven, probably wouldn't have been up quite so early. But just beautiful vistas. Um, this is looking over uh, the hotel is kind of just behind that lower bottom tree. This would be a really fun quiz for folks, but I had mentioned before how some species that we see down there are kind of just so different um, despite being the same species. This is the different subspecies of red-tailed hawk. Uh, this is the Costa Recensis subspecies of red-tailed hawk, just so much color underneath compared to the very pale birds that we have. Ruddy-capped nightingale thrush, um, uh, much more often heard than seen. Mountain Elania in these high elevations. And the long-tailed silky flycatcher, one of my most wanted birds to see on the trip. They're not uncommon, um, they're just stunning. Uh, and I had just missed this shot of it. You can see the fruit on the left side it had plucked one of those, um, but literally turned its head away. So there's actually someone else behind me, better angle that, that nailed the shot. I forgot to track it down for this talk, but um, anyways. Moving along, uh, getting out of the mountains, um, making our kind of roadside stops for, of course, hummingbirds, should have only put hummingbirds into this uh, slideshow, uh, white-throated mountain gem, but, Again, our, our big target here, despite seeing a dozen species uh, of hummingbirds, the white-crested coquette. Um, 
wonderful name. All the coquettes tend to have these uh, very cool plumes on their heads, but uh, white crested was our, our big target. Now um, we're, we're gonna be driving kind of along the Pacific coast here. And what I want to sh you to see is kind of the, the coloration of the trees along this huge stretch. We measured it, the section that we drove was 35 miles. Um, and notice how it's really this monoculture, this unique, this one color. Um, and as we start zooming in, um, you get these little villages that were kind of built every few miles or, or so. Um, and those would be, you know, the, the families, they would usually have um, a public space. There were even little schools within each one, um, but tiny little villages that would just be completely surrounded by palm plantations. Um, so this was this entire stretch and you can see from here, all of this land is being cleared to plant more palm, 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 palm. Uh, especially for the sake of time, um, I, I hope this is not news to anyone, but the amount of um, palm that is just being planted all over the tropics. This was um, my wife and I's honeymoon to Thailand, these amazing birds that I wanted to see there and places where they were known to be, we'd go and just find cleared uh, plantations for, for palms. Um, the amount of habitat loss just for this one magic ingredient that shows up in almost everything we use. Um, this is a long way for me to say like, if you can reduce the amount of palm that you use in the products that you're um, getting, uh, please try because you see the impact when you go to someplace like the tropics here. Um, I can't believe it's 7.09. Uh, I'm gonna keep going until someone tells me that uh, uh, that people are- You're fine, are Doug, you're fine. Keep going as long as you'd like. Fantastic, because I'm having a great time. So are we. Um, if you can, you know, cut back on your palm, uh, that's fantastic. At least keep your cat indoors. Um, being in the tropics is terrible, but we know the cats are killing one, you know, conservative uh, one, what, 1.4 billion birds just in the US alone. So uh, I love seeing this little guy down there, but keep cats indoors, they're terrible. Um, back to the birding trip, it was a fantastic time. Literally just the roadside stops. This is where we stopped for lunch one day. Um, you cannot beat uh, the wonderful fruity beverages that were to be had um, and to be able to bird just from the, you know, your, your table. Um, this thing was huge. It was not a toy, as I thought at first. Um, it's the appropriately named giant red-winged grasshopper um, that we just happened to see uh, essentially right in front of where we parked on the, the side of the restaurant. So um, gross. Birding the side of the road, I think we had pulled over because, um, what was it? We might have spotted a pearl kite and then all of a sudden just started seeing more and more uh, uh, raptors just flying over at this spot. But um, then we finally spotted the Pacific Ocean, which is always fun for someone who's been in Maine their whole life. Um, and to really drive home the, the crazy change in, in habitat, quick trigger warning, if people don't like creepy crawlies, if the grasshopper was weird enough for you, um, you might not like this. Uh, scorpions, um, because uh, this was something Jesse was talking about kind of all the days leading up. Uh, each night we would walk around uh, the lodges trying to find them, but it was it up until this point, it had always been too humid um, or just too wet uh, that things like scorpions just weren't around. So when we got to this lodge that was dry enough, um, so cool to go out and look at scorpions. This is under a UV light. Um, scorpions uh, reflect that, that UV spectrum. So they tend to really pop and show up. So just as a comparison, this is a photo taken under that UV light and then just with a normal flashlight. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly what species these are. Jesse's a pretty big scorpion geek apparently. Um, but uh, it was pretty spectacular.
Um, much like La Selva was a, a big destination um, in the Caribbean slope, uh, uh, Carrera is one of the um, better known birding destinations along the Pacific slope, at least in, in this region where we were. Um, it's a really interesting spot because it's kind of this transition zone between uh, some of the really humid habitats of southwestern Co Costa Rica and the drier habitats in the northwest of, uh, of the country. So for our tour, you know, as I said at the beginning, it was, it was a nice way to be able to kind of get birds that are representative of, of both areas. Field Guides runs tours where they will just focus in like the southwest or the northwest and really targeting those. But for, since this was just our, uh, our quick hit to get um, really as many species as we could, uh, we found kind of the perfect spot right in the middle. Ants, um, I, we could do a whole talk on just ants for the sake of time. I'll just say the leafcutter ants are as cool in real life as they are in the documentaries. Um, the trails that they would essentially establish where they can actually you know, put a, uh, a crossing sign along the path so you can watch your step as you're going. Um, we met some pretty nasty ants that even gave me a bite on the last day that lasted for quite a while. Um, but things like black-throated trogon, white-whiskered puffbird. I tried to pick representatives of, um, obviously we've seen a ton of hummingbirds, but representatives of, of different families that you just are never gonna see um, really until you get down to the tropics. Uh, the cocoa wood creeper, wood creepers all look the same, um, but of course we had to track them all down. Not ivory-billed woodpecker, uh, but the pale-billed woodpecker, very close to something like our pileated. And of course, our, our big target here, trying to find a uh, truly wild uh, scarlet macaw. Um, Mexican tree porcupine was a, a weird treat. What a just odd looking critter. And now kind of getting away from Carrera, we, uh, really just some more of that side of the road birding, if, if we want to call it that, um, but just trying to find different, this was what I would call coastal arid habitat. Um, this bare-throated tiger heron that uh, just, we had glimpsed them and then all of a sudden to have this one put on really the best show you could ever imagine. Uh, this, was, this might almost be embarrassing um, to say how long it took us to find this uh, striped cuckoo that was just calling incessantly at the top of this tree. You see this photo and how obvious it looks. I, I meant to put in a, a zoomed out photo as well, but this thing was just so perfectly camouflaged. Um, and I believe this was the one, uh, our, uh, the, the local driver we had, who was um, a good birder in his own right, um, every now and then would just completely surprise us by, you know, we'd, we'd, you know, be intently looking at something or trying to find something. And, you know, then he would just, in his, in his very subtle ways, uh, you know, point it out for, for all of us. So um, many hands make light work, I guess. Now we found our driest stretch um, uh, and arguably some of our some of the hottest areas as we're getting closer to some mangroves. Um, but uh, as you get into different habitats, you get the different species that are representative of them. And things like um, white-throated magpie jay is just a stunning bird. This is a very large bird. It's uh, similar to a, a jay, like a blue jay. Uh, they're even you know larger than them with those long tails, and of course that amazing crest on the top of their head. Uh, this was a fun one for me to see because uh, when we were in Oaxaca a year earlier in Mexico, um, we made a specific trip to the super dry, arid um, place, uh, really going south out of Oaxaca, um, specifically trying to find white-throated magpie jays. Um, so it was really cool to um, my limited view of birding outside of you know the Northeast, Northeast U.S. Um, to see like, wow, like this bird really does, you know, need that type of habitat. Um, anyways, it's, it's a fun learning experience for me as well um, on these trips. 
group build Ani, uh, she's in the family with cuckoos, uh, surprisingly enough. And then one of the favorite birds of the trip, the turquoise browed Mott Mott, um, because it is the namesake bird of Jesse Fagan, a, a nice tradition of, um, of field guides is, is giving a lot of their guides a, a bird name. Um, one of the most stunning sunsets we've ever seen, um, especially after you've been in a really arid area. I'm gonna wrap this up with the kind of last story of uh, on our last day, we um, had kind of an ace up our sleeve of, a, of doing a boat trip. Um, finally, uh, the name of this bird will give it away. It's a mangrove swallow. And so we had a boat uh, scheduled for us to take us through some mangroves and uh, in the town of uh, Tarcoles, which is just a, a wonderful way to experience birds. Um, because you can basically just sit and, you know, have Jesse at the front yelling, on your left is a, another tiger heron on the right, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just, uh, you know, an awesome, awesome venue with truly stunning views all around. Um, checking things like the, the sand bank here, it was uh, fun to be looking for different species of, of like shorebirds. And as soon as we pull up, notice how everyone is um, being very careful standing up on the front of the boat, uh, completely aware of the uh, uh, crocodile that's sneaking up beside them. Um, Clearly this poor critter has become very habituated to boats pulling up. I'm sure there's lots of tours or tourists um, that just pull up and, and feed this guy all the time. Um, but it was certainly well fed. Interestingly, at that same spot, this yellow-headed caracara came down um, and actually started vocalizing while we were there. So most likely people are feeding that croc and this caracara is picking up any scraps that it doesn't get to, um, which made photography really easy. Anyways, birding from the boat, uh, start racking up um, uh, nice diversity of birds, like um, it's a giant cowbird, uh, things like muscovy ducks that you'd see walking around farms in Maine to actually see the, the wild stock that they come from was uh, quite neat. Wimbrel on their wintering grounds, uh, soon to be flying through Maine. They're just a migrant that passes through, but we know, especially in the fall, um, often stopping over in blueberry barrens in, in large numbers. Um, quick plug for Peter Vickery's Birds of Maine book. Um, just the, the single plate that Lars Johnson did of uh, painting uh, Wimbrel walking through the blueberry barrens of Maine, that, that is worth the, the price of that book alone. And one of our big targets, the uh, boat build uh, night heron has this big honking uh, uh, bill on it. Um, unfortunately, they were all roosting when we saw them, um, occasionally moving, maybe showing the bill a little bit, um, but kind of funny to not be able to see the, uh, the namesake uh, for that bird. Uh, the hawks were wonderful, common, um, the mangrove subspecies of the common black hawk. Um, and I guess kind of in closing, um, the point I wanted to make, and, and I'll kind of wrap this up with that plug for field guides again, is really how dependent, um, or, or, or I should say, how dependent a, a subset of Costa Ricans are on ecotourism. It's, it's a massive industry down there. Um, I tried charting out, um, this was probably not the right way to do it, but um, charting out the number of eBird checklists that were submitted in Costa Rica um, each year. And almost every year they had about a 20% increase um, which is more people using eBird, but I think it's also, you know, uh, it, it's a good kind of measure of, of how many people are out there um, birding. And you could see right around March of 2020, um, there was no growth. It, it actually started declining um, 
instead of growing 10%, it was declining about 10%, um, which you would maybe even think more um, just given how restricted travel was, but there's still you know, plenty of people in Costa Rica that I'm sure are using eBird. Um, so anyways, just to mention like the, the number, like everywhere we went, obviously we are, that's what we're there for, um, but everywhere we went, you would see essentially these, you know, little um, signs for little businesses, um, all kind of realizing the, the wonderful resources uh, that they have um, right down there. It's, it's, it's uh, I don't know, in closing, I'll just say it's, it's remarkable how important um, it is for them. In talking with field guides about some of these tours, you know, they're really concerned about, you know, people can get vaccinated and, and they might, they still might not be able to run these tours because they don't know, uh, you know, what some of these uh, locals can offer anymore. So uh, I checked just before this and um, uh, at least Cope, people were still reporting uh, uh, birds from his backyard every single day, basically throughout the pandemic. So Nice to see that, you know, he's still able to operate, but there's a number of, of birding lodges. Um, uh, what's the, there's a big one in, in Trinidad, um, Ace to Wright, I believe, um, that just announced that they, they're essentially closing their doors um, because they just, they can't sustain themselves without the increased uh, tourism. Um, so for now, with 168 countries, currently uh, considered a very high um, uh, risk, I guess, from the CDC. Basically, they don't recommend traveling at all. Um, that's my way to say we're, usually I would end these slides with plugging the next trips that Maine Audubon's doing, what's coming up next. Um, stay tuned. I hope that maybe in 2022, uh, we can do some of these trips again. Um, in the meantime, we will stay local. We're looking at how we can be doing more bird walks, um, like usual, but uh, uh, more bird walks here in the state that are going to be safe for um, everyone to participate in. So with my last 10 seconds, I will say check out fieldguides.com. Uh, it's this outbirding with field guides uh, that you can see this video series that they're doing. Um, you can subscribe. Uh, get to watch uh, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, so thank you all for bearing with me so much. I know I went over uh, at least the time that I had planned on going. Um, but uh, yeah, for, for bearing with me through this and, and especially the kind of um, my frantic start at the beginning. So uh, I had a great time. Um, and I guess I'll say if there are questions that came in. Um, yes, there the are. And bearing with you is not the right word. That was such a <laughs> thank you so much for that. Gorgeous, gorgeous photography and just great insight into all of your experience there. It was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, let's jump into the questions because Barry asks, what field guides and or apps did you use for the Costa Rica birds? This one. <laughs> Garrigus is, uh, Richard Garrigus is the um, author that did kind of um, what a lot of people think of as the definitive Costa Rican field guide. I also, um, the funny thing is I left my copy in the hotel uh, the first night. Um, so I had to, uh, when we got to La Selva, um, I bought this in the gift shop there. Um, Thank goodness. It was, Which was nice because it, it's, it's the second edition. Um, the other one I'll quickly recommend um, uh, Andrew Valley and Dale Dyer did this great uh, Birds of Central America. Um, it's all of Central America, so it is huge. It's probably not what you would ever want to take in the field with you. Um, but what I really enjoyed about it is instead of just seeing, you know, a the couple species that are going to be in Costa Rica, you would have like, you know, all of those similar looking woodpeckers that are kind of throughout the range. So for me, like overwhelming, um, 
but I really enjoy kind of seeing what is that spectrum um, of birds. And they did a fantastic job representing even all the subspecies that are field identifiable subspecies kind of across the region. So those two books and my mind's going too fast. The Merlin Bird ID app is the other, is a free app on your phone that has a specific Costa Rica package um, that you can download and even has audio recordings of almost all the birds that are there. So when Jesse was like, Doug, do you have pig build finch recordings on your phone? I was like, of course I, yes. of course I do. Uh, <laughs> Pull all the tricks out of your hat, right? <laughs> yes. Perfect. Uh, somewhere. Um, okay, so Martha wants to know, what was the name of the cafe where you stopped? The feeding station with the bananas that had the emerald uh, toucanet. Does anybody yep. remember that one? Um, I've got it right here. Uh, I'm going to put the, I'm going to put it in the chat because my Spanish, uh, uh, Galleria de Calibre, which is the gallery of, of hummingbirds. Okay. Um, but then there's this, uh, E Soda, uh, Chin, Chinchona. So sorry. Uh, Chinchona. Um, I took Spanish in high school and, uh, it's okay. It I, I'm from Miami. I forgive you. <laughs> My pronunciation's horrible too. <laughs> um, okay, thank you for that. Uh, Jeremy wants to know: Did you see Costa Rica's national bird, the clay-colored thrush? Yes. Um, uh, it's funny because I I had photos of them in here, and then uh, realizing that I had way too many slides, they always tell you to put uh, one. One slide per minute is a good way to time yourself. Um, so having whatever I had, 228 slides, I was doomed for failure. But um, I actually went through and removed the clay colored thrush. I guess I forgot it was the national bird. Oh. Um, so, <laughs> so now we'll, we'll look it up to make sure because we want to see it. Yeah, um, you could, there were some in the background of that feeder photo. They're really, they look like all gray, or excuse me, all kind of, well, clay colored hmm. uh, robins. Ah, okay. Well, it must be difficult for them to have chosen, you know, a particular bird considering the just bevy of gorgeousness that that uh, seems to reside there. Um, we're having a lot of really nice compliments coming in. Great presentation. Looking forward to the day when we can travel again. Um, thank you for letting a couple from Saskatoon. Uh, thanks so much. Lovely, amazing pictures. Good way to support the local Costa Rican economy. Great photos, just lots and lots of really lovely uh, comments. And I just second all of them. And I know that that Kit and Gail do as well. Kit, did you want to jump in to say anything before before we jump off? Oh, I'm seeing Kit move, but I'm not hearing I'm not hearing anything coming out of her out of her lips. Kit, you're unmuted, but for some reason, oh. Not sure. Um, she's given thumbs up. There we go. <laughs> All right. Well, Doug. Then, then I'll just say thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for the kind words in the chat. Um, uh, I did saw some familiar faces here. Fantastic to see Gail uh, for you know supporting Maine Audubon. Me, you know, coming on that that trip and and then giving me this venue. It's, I've always loved doing programs for the. Uh, Camden Public Library and, and always happy to do more. So hope oh, we good. can talk more birds soon uh, in the future. We will definitely, definitely have you back. And we just had some messaging. Uh, thank you from Saskatchewan. So we're even being joined from folks in Canada. Very cool. All right, everyone, thank you again. We do these monthly. Check the Camden uh, Public Library's calendar. Check the Mid Coast Audubon's calendar. Visit their website. Great resources there. Um, obviously visit Maine Audubon's website as well. And Doug, thank you again. Have a great rest of your time off and I hope your kitchen turns out awesome. <laughs> thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.